So ladies and gentlemen, this is the first in the series of uh, what I will call live interviews. Although they're not live, but what they are is the precursors to the actual live presentations that we're doing on the rally. And what I've done is invited a few friends to come along uh, and have a little chat about rallying before the rally itself. Obviously the Northwest Stages rally. Uh, who knows who'll walk through the door? Well, lo and behold, it's Nigel Worswick, everybody. Hi, Nigel. Hi, Chris. I'll get your coffee in a little bit. Uh, Thank you. It's cold <laughs> nice there. to see you. We'll take a seat whenever you're ready and we'll, we'll talk about rallying. Yeah. Are you leaving your coat on? No, I'll take off. So it's a little cold in the studio. Yeah. Here's the coffee that you ordered earlier. Okay, thank you very much. Milk, one sugar. Okay. You probably have no sugars cut down on work ready for the rally, shouldn't we? Get in training <laughs> or something. Get in training, exactly. Mm. So, Legend Fires Northwest Stages 2024. Mm. Um, for people that don't know you, first of all, Nigel, who are you? Tell us a bit about you. Oh. Uh, I've been rallying a long while in various cars over the years. I actually started off navigating with my brother and then I started off doing stage rally driving, uh, various championships and even the all round of the World Rally Championship, I think five times, Lombard RAC Rally. And um, so, yeah, and I've been lucky enough to drive a number of just decent cars over the time, nearly all of which we built ourselves or with friends, which is a fabulous way to do because you do well in a rally in a car that you built with your friends. With your friend navigating and your friend servicing, it doesn't get any better than that. Going to say welcome to everybody again because what we've done is we've basically been having a chat with Nigel Wordswick and it's been so entertaining. I think I'm going to leave the whole interview and all our chat uh, in the video, but it's going to come after this quick chat because we, we need to put this bit in early on because we're going to try and talk to people that might not understand too much about rallying and just cover the event before we go into too much detail about trying to predict the top three and talk about rallying in general. Um, so back to the uh, back to the start, it's the Legend Fires Northwest Stages 2024. As we can see on the website uh, next to us, there's a whole website full of information. There's, if you're interested in coming to Spectate, um, then the, go to the website because you've got lots of information on there that you'll probably need. But uh, Nigel's a competitor on the event. Uh, I've been around the event for many years. Between the two of us, we'll just quickly talk about the character of it um, for anybody that doesn't really know what rallying is. And I would say this event is super special, especially for this year because it's a round of the British Rally Championship and we're going to get... 130 drivers the top 50 at least are in four-wheel drive supercars that are going to be thrilling to see and part of this event itself we've also got a ceremonial start which is at Garstang and that's a very special uh, thing that doesn't happen often enough in rallying which is basically a show to the public like a pit lane in Formula One but it's out there in Garstang town centre uh, and we basically invite the public to come along and meet the drivers uh, and get involved in rallying and there's so many families and young kids that come there as well as traditional rally drivers and, and spectators that have been uh, looking at rallies for many years but as far as the overall event's concerned, you're a competitor, Nigel. You did it last time, it was out two years ago. Um, what's it like for you? Tell us, from, from a competitor point of view, what's this event all about? Well, the rally's amazing. <clears throat> the roads are just some of the best we've got, you know, and we've, we've always wished we could rally around here, like in this way, and we can do now. Um, what you're saying about this Friday night, uh, I think it's a, a pre-start, really, if you will. The cars come through at minute intervals, very, very slowly, and go over the ramp. So you can, the family can bring the kids and stuff like that. There's no danger, there's no threat. The whole main street's left open. The first year they ran it, this particular Garstang start, uh, this is the third one, the first time, the pub ran out of beer, the cheese shop ran out of cheese. Honestly, it's just absolutely bad. The, the street was just full of people. And it's free. You can turn up, I think it's from about 7 o'clock, for instance. And they come through in, in car order, so car one will come first, slowly down the street, up onto the ramp, get interviewed, can go down there, that's what they have to say, look at the cars. The cars are fabulous to look at. All of the graphics on the colours and everything are bright and the drivers are there, they get out, you can have a chat with them. Um, it's just a really nice free night out, really a good atmosphere. A lovely carnival atmosphere because we're led by a live music, there's going to be big screens there this year uh, and I'll say as a spectator's point of view it is so nice to get near the drivers and because the drivers are, are queuing up in the way that they do um, it's lovely to go and chat and many of them will let you look inside the cars and uh, really get involved so it, it's 
yeah, that's the warmest thing about it. It's, a, it's really warming and encouraging for the spectators to come along. And therefore, there's going to be at least 5,000 people visit Garstang Town Centre for what they're saying is their busiest live event of the whole year. So uh, that's really thrilling. But actually, the event itself from a spectator point of view, if you're coming down to get involved with the cars and maybe a part of the service crew, the first location that you'll get the opportunity to see the rally in its organising form, the scrutineering, so the scrutiny of the cars, the service vehicles unloading the cars, mm -hmm. many of them will be towed to the events with big teams, trucks and that type of thing, is actually at my school college, um, which is on the Friday, and I'm looking at this little sheet now, which is on the website, um, from 12 o'clock, spectators are welcome to come down to the college, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, it, it's open to the public, there's no cost to it, I know things have been on display, it's a little bit geeky in the sense that what you're seeing is almost behind the scenes with the cars. Mm. But again, many people will, will have friends competing. And if you've got availability in, uh, on a Friday afternoon, maybe you've sneaked off work a little bit early, uh, then that's open to the public and there is entertainment and things put on for you at the college. The college do make everybody very welcome there, don't they? Well, every single car has to go through there for scrutiny. So we have to scrutiny the car, <clears throat> and we have to sign on, uh, which is a relevant thing. And this year we've got to wire trackers up, so we've actually got a little bit of work as well, because every single car has a tracker on it as well. Yeah. We've got to plug in and make sure that all works. So every single car associated with the rally will come through there at some point. Yeah, and so just a quick nod out to MySchool College as well, that they're a motorsport specialist college, mm -hmm. so they have motorsport degrees and different courses and a whole team of students there, some mature, some very young, who are running, uh, well, learning all about motorsport at many different levels. They, I know they have race team, technicians, uh, all sorts of different things, even have very good guest speakers Mm. lined up to uh, present to the students which includes me have you done one of those i've done two of them i got <laughs> i think one of the lecturers was off ill and i got a frantic phone call from ronnie sandham who used to be the lecturer there said could you come over and do an afternoon on motorsport man <laughs> yeah okay so luckily i had a uh, presentation that i'd done at clitheroe car pub so i just took my laptop across and did that yeah and, and a quick nod out to you as well as being a rally driver you're you're a engineer and engineering family mm. um just tell us a little bit about that well we make massive machines that cast molten metal we don't cast molten metal we sell them to people all around the world so if you're digging a mountain out in peru or something digging books out of something about aluminium and you smelt it you might have a furnace of 30 ton of aluminium you can't sell that so you need to put it through one of our machines as quickly as possible to make it into ingots into stacks that you can put onto a wagon and into a ship really unusual thing to do but it has to be done. Uh, and you're also based near one of the event's uh, leading characters, let's call him, uh, a rally outright winner, but also on this occasion, really special to us in the event because it's the Legends uh, Northwest Stages uh, and he's Mr. Legend, so Legend Fires uh, of John Stone. And you, you're based near him. Yeah, fabulous guy. I mean, he supports so many things. He does it in such an understated way. But he gives, you know, fabulous. Uh, you understated know, it's comparative isn't it <laughs> no it is he doesn't he doesn't try and take credit for it he just does it and and little things that you don't even know when i got my car i hadn't got any rims for it and i'd got them on order but i hadn't got them i wanted to test the car <clears throat> so i just said can i borrow some rims yeah no problem you know things like that so fabulous guy can't can't speak highly enough for him really. yeah great local competitor and as you say super friendly uh, but he's doing the event and we will be doing an interview with him uh, later in the week so um, now to just talk a little bit about, well, actually, I'll just uh, finish this section by saying if you're interested in spectating, there are opportunities for you to buy parking spaces at the Wild Boar Park. What you need to do is go and find that on the website. Uh, if you look into spectators and then where to watch and then go right to the bottom of the page, the very last availabilities for parking, for prepaid parking anywhere on the event is available on the website still. Um, if you're watching this, you might be one of the lucky few because every other parking uh, area is sold out at the moment. Um, so, therefore, you need to quickly go onto the website and book your place at the Wild Boar Park uh, parking, which is a lovely facility, I've got to say. It's a, a brilliant place. There's a little, well, I won't over-describe it, but it's a, it's a fantastic area to be parking at because it's part of a, a public attraction and a mini zoo for children. But the, while the facility itself won't be open to the public they've still got uh, 
cater in there, toilets, etc. So it's a lovely place to uh, be parking as part of the event. Go on to the website and make that. Right, uh, down to rallying. We're going to start off by trying to predict the top three. So we're going to jump back to what we were talking about earlier before we got too carried away with this. If you enjoy your rallying, hopefully you'll enjoy this fantastic uh, chat that we had yeah. about 20 minutes ago. And I'm going to cut into it and we'll restart about now. So let's go back in history a little bit because you, as a local guy, you'll know all about the event itself. And actually in its current format, it's a round of the British Rally Championship, so it's a BRC round, which is amazing. But we've known it for many years, haven't we? And in all sorts of different ways. And I can go back, I think probably nearly 15 years ago, yeah. maybe more when I first saw it and doing, I actually saw this rally take a stage at Haitian Edge, go-kart racing circuit oh, yeah. in Morecambe yeah, yeah. Um, but we've been on a beach side at Blackpool um, Wheaton Camp all sorts of different areas so did you do it back in the day? Not quite back in the day but he, as you know this was a brainchild of Dave Reed who's sadly no longer with us he'd be so proud of where we've got it to or where everybody else has got it to um, and he started off and he started he was the best guy in the world for finding venues nearly all the venues on the early versions of this rally he personally went and found knocking on doors can we use your sewage pay, can we use your stately home, can we come down the prom, can we come through Pontins, can we... you think of nearly every single one, he found it, right? So he put together that one and that was basically made off little bits of closed private land that we got permission to use. And it was a really successful rally. Well, Dave wanted a course car, and so for many years I actually did it in my car, in the World Rally Escort, um, which, uh, you know, quite entertaining because he wanted, I suppose I can say this now because I didn't crash a safe pair of hands, but somebody going quick enough that it would be representative to get the spectator out of the way, but also somebody to look at the stages with maybe a critical eye. So like there was one finish of one and there was sheet ice. So before they could run the stage, I, I passed a message back to the beginning from this gate to that watch out, it's sheet ice. You know? And I think the competitors appreciated that. I think they appreciated knowing there was a fellow competitor in a quick car doing the stages before them. So if I said this stage is all right for you to do, I think they felt it was. I hope so anyway. Yeah, it's a good point. So it's, it, the rally itself, um, I mean, say it's taken different formats, but now it's closed road rallying, and that is, I mean, you know this as a competitor, but, but tell us about the characteristics that's different on a closed road rally. Yeah. So these are public roads that are closed, so we don't get done for speeding. Um, but obviously the main aim is to go as fast as you can, so it's aggressive, flat-out competition. Um, but tell us about the characteristics, because we are blessed with some of the most beautiful, characterful uh, public roads for motoring, aren't we? Well, in one way, they are quite similar. We have to get between these bits that are allocated for us, be it these little McNass plates, all these proper bits of roads, and on those bits of road, we have to pay all the speed limits, all the road traffic signs, everything. So if you see rally cars bottoming down the road, that's what we call a road section. It's just to get the cars from one bit we're allowed to use safely to another bit we're allowed to use. The early rally used to do that, so we might drive from Lytham, we might go slowly up to Pontins or Blackpool or something, so we used to do that. The beautiful difference here is we're using proper roads now, more natural. It must be the most natural test of a car. I mean, people say Formula One, well, that's not a test of a car like you're doing. You know. This is testing down roads that people are driving up every day, you know, the most testing roads that people up every day, they're up and down them. And we're taking rally cars down them. And it's got to improve the breed, not that it really matters to us because we're club and we just do it for fun. but. It's an unbelievable test of car, driver, co-driver, let's not forget co-drivers, we have to read these notes, pace notes we call them, that we'll get on to. With the trust you have to have in your co-driver, I don't know how they do it. They don't even look up, you know. <laughs> no, they really don't. I've heard the good ones don't. <laughs> well, they Unless they're scared, that's my, <laughs> my experience. If they get scared, they tend to look up. Well, they feel it. They look up a cave, they might just do a glance, but it's, it's, they read the bend and they can feel the bend and feel the bump. And if the pace notes we've written are correct, and they barely look up, barely, honestly. Looking at the action footage that we see there on the stages, it, the really narrow country lanes, and actually that reminds me that in this area, this part of the world, we'll know these roads through some of the gold road rallying, which goes back quite a while. But did you ever do road rallying? I mean, I just assume you did, but I always remember you as a stage rally man and special stages, but closed roads rather than public roads. That's true. I did actually navigate on um, road rallies, you call them, which are fabulous training. But it was just on the swap over, and I never really did night rallies um, as a driver, virtually. So I was just, it was just at the point when the, the sport was flipping over that the fast drivers, like my brother and people like that, go, well, no, we're going to move on to this new stage rallying thing. 
So, although I've, I know it, I've never really driven competitively on a night rally. I think they're great, I love them, you know, but I don't have a car suitable for it and got enough on the plate really at the moment, so yeah. Well, I certainly noticed in previous rallies that I've commentated on, a lot of people from Wales in particular are coming to do these closed road rallies because they come from road rallying, so it's a very mm. natural progression from those guys. Um, talking about that, what we've got now is the, the round of the British Rally Championship, which basically means the pinnacle of British rallying has come to our neck of the woods to start their international what, British Rally Championship campaign. So it's a massive endorsement to the organisers to what they've actually achieved at the North West stages uh, to be able to put on a round of the British Rally Championship, which is thrilling in itself. Now, maybe in recent years as well, you could argue that the British Championship isn't quite as, uh, let's say, blessed with high level entries than it has been in previous years but this year is completely different this year amazingly we've got 50 r2 r5 cars oh. um, and, and the best competitive field if you look at previous winners previous champions um, mm. we're going to go through that in detail but actually just from the outside you've got the most exciting lineup of r5 type cars that we've probably ever seen in a british rally championship round and i'd argue probably even better than some of what we'd look back on and say is a heyday. You know, even the Harry Vatten and mm. Russell Brooks, Jim and McCray eras were all well and good, but I can't ever think of a field of 50 similar cars to the point where nearly anybody can win. It, um, it may be a contentious thing to say, but I actually think it's the biggest rally since the last time the World Rally Championship came here, is it about five years ago? And for those people who don't want an R5 car, it's about the fastest thing you can rally nowadays. It's four wheel drive, it's turbocharged, Unbelievably quick cars, and that's when when you're saying there's 50 of these, all the top 50 are ridiculously fast cars with brilliant drivers, and below behind there, even behind there, they're still very very good. So I think it, I I'm prepared to stick my own heart and say this is actually the biggest rally we've had for years. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely believe that. I perfectly argue that, and you can tell by the quality of the field because well, we'll just mention one for now. But Chris Ingram is an ex-European rally champion and, and is a current World Rally 2 driver. Mm. So we've got somebody who's doing a you know, last couple of years in the World Rally Championship coming to do the British Rally mm. uh, Championship. Cool. So we've got the nephew of Colin McRae, um, which is that's going to be fascinating to see as well in a top level car, exactly the same as everybody else. He's seeded at 21 mm. max, uh, which will be thrilling to see what he can achieve as a, as a youngster. I think he's still 18, 19 years old. Mm. Um, but yeah, you look through that field, which we're going to go and try and predict the top three. It's an amazing lineup of, of drivers to go and look at. So we know they're fast, four wheel drive, purpose built rally cars. So is yours. Yeah, so you, you represent the local boys and <laughs> clubman drivers. Yeah. Uh, and and what, do, what do we mean when we say a clubman driver? What's the difference in you and somebody that's doing the BRC? It's a grey area, but I think a clubman driver is probably when you're paying for it yourself, maybe with a few small sponsors. I think if you start having big sponsors such that you nearly everything's paid for you, perhaps moved out of that spec. And um, you know, Max, not to belittle him, he's got, he's actually one of two works for them sport drivers, the other one being Gary Pearson. Now he's in the early part of his career, so we shouldn't expect too much. Everybody thinks he's very talented, but he's done very, very little and this is very much a growing year for him, so you know, it'll be good to see how he gets on. I'm sure he'll get there. Uh, but just at this stage, don't start saying, oh, you know, why is he not winning? No. Um, you know, I mean, he's seen it at 21 because that's where they think about his speed is at the moment. Uh, but he'll no doubt get better. Um, he's already shown very well in various rallies. And going back to Chris Ingram, which you mentioned at the beginning, why on earth is he not a works driver? Wouldn't it be fabulous to see him in a Ford Rally 1 car? His talent deserves it, but this is the problem that you get to. It's, at the end of the day, it's money. If, if he could go to one of the teams and say, I've got however many millions, probably of pounds it takes, could I drive one of your cars, please? I'm sure he could be in one next week. And he deserves it. And I hope, I hope he gets there. I think everybody does in this area. We watch him and we keep on. And he does amazing things without as much practice as some of the people he's beating. So, yeah, fantastic. Well, the nice thing for the championship is Chris has proven at world championship level. European champion, as I say, has succeeded a lot. Great young driver. Um, many people would maybe think from the outside that coming back to do a British Championship when you're a world, a proven competitor at the very highest level and you're coming back a step to do a British Championship, you know, why would you do that when you're trying to get the ultimate prize? But you've, you've hit it on a nutshell. 
to be able to compete at World Rally Championship level is so much money. And I'd love the idea that somebody would come and be British champion, prove themselves against good competition and maybe go back into doing the World Championship. And Chris actually told me that um, one of the reasons that he wants to come back and actually he's looking at doing a full campaign of the British Championship this year is not just to win it, but to actually to enjoy his rallying again. Mm. And, and my time around him when he was doing the European Championship, you do forget that when we're talking World Championship, European Championship, he's hardly spending any time back at home in Manchester. No. He's not really around sponsors and his friends or anything like that. He's become a European being. He lives you know, hand to mouth over in Europe at any given point of where the rallies are. And he's basically traveling the world and that sounds good. But when you're on a limited budget, that's um, basically backpacking between events. Whereas back here in the UK, I hope he can have a foundation of support mm. um, that might help him leapfrog to the next level. It's a weird one this, because winning the British Championship in the past hasn't got you anywhere. Because I mean, Matt Edwards won it 3 maybe four times, sorry if I'm wrong. Keith Cronin, I think, has won it three times. Yeah, who's seeded at number two, so we yeah. haven't talked about Keith yet. But what I'm saying is neither of those got lifted up to a works drive. No. If you look at what Ford did and how much they value the British Championship, when Elfin was doing okay, they actually decided it might be good to take a step down and do a year British Championship. He dominated it, fair enough, and then they moved him back up to a World Rally car and look where he's gone on to do. Adrian Formo was probably a bit early in his career, were very, very fast and had a few accidents. What they do, dropped him back to British Rally Champions last year. He won every single round and he's now back in a Rally 1 car. So on the one hand, it might be hiding to nothing, but on the other one, it might be a stepping stone as well. So that was Keith Cronin just letting us know that we haven't spoken about him yet. <laughs> yeah. uh, it wasn't really, but, but we, uh, oh. I've been saving this topic because we could arguably say that Keith Cronin, seeded at number two, is at least one of the most successful drivers of all time in the British Championship. He's still mm. relatively young. Mm. He's a four times outright winner of the championship. Mm. Um, he's got as much credibility as anybody. He's in a great car, he's seeded at two. Um, he's got every reason to expect to beat Chris Ingram. And if he does, that's a really big scalp for him. And, and mm. Keith is um, proven and unbelievably difficult to beat. So mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, on his day, he's going to push Chris, you know, all the way. And Chris will do really well to be beating um, a proven champion who's, who's not going to be, in that sense, under any pressure, but who will love the opportunity to try and prove himself against Chris. In that way, really, Chris hasn't got a lot to gain by doing this event because he won it last year. If he wins, they go, oh, well, he won. And if he doesn't, then, you know. Uh, and yeah, I mean, Keith Crone would be a good scout to, to get if he could from his point of view. Um, I, I tend to favour Chris because they're both brilliant drivers. I couldn't even separate them really. But Chris has done the rally. Hmm. And although we can all do what we call a recce where we get a chance to drive down on stage at slow speed, there's nothing quite like driving them flat out and seeing whether your instructions you wrote down last year that you corrected, or two years ago, sorry, if you corrected those that you got the stage bang on and you can now go, I think it might just give him a little bit of edge, Chris. And of course, he's got European experience, which is, is handy as well. That sort of, the level that they're at, they can push that hard all the time mm. because they have to. But Keith can as well. I mean, it's just it's ridiculous. You, you're sort of looking at them going, who can, can we pick the top three? Or well, we're trying to pick the top, the top three. 10 or 15, maybe, and, you know. Uh, Ocean Price in at three. Um, I, I mean, again, on his day, he can beat Keith. We've proven that in the past. Yeah. So can he do it on tarmac? I think he's done it before in the past. Um, I, he, that seeding is probably about right um, to be third, but only just. Austin a brilliant driver anyway, generally, yeah. but I forget, I think he went, did he not go to Ireland and basically take the fight to the Irish on their own territory? Mm. That is tough. And he did it successfully, you know, and I, pff, hats, hats off to him for that, so... You know, we're looking at another amazing driver. I mean, I'm sorry if I'm just saying everybody's an amazing driver. I don't but, but saying this, but... Yeah, and you're talking about a previous yeah. winner of the championship as well. Yeah. So and that's just the top three. Uh, Marion Evans at fourth. Again, same thing, yeah. Uh, VW Polo. He's gone uh, to Ireland. And... Yeah, yeah, done great. And we're talking about the next Irish guy up with a Fiesta 2, uh, who is William Creighton. Creighton. Yeah. Well, I think he's, either, he's done World Championship, have you? It's yeah. something like Rally 4 or Rally 3 level or something. I think he's moved to Rally 2 now. So he's definitely an up-and-coming star. I mean, his pace is unbelievable. He's just working his way up through the hierarchy. 
he's quick enough. It'll be interesting to see how he goes out in a faster car because like, is this the first time he's had to go in one? I don't know. But definitely got the pace and he's got um, a lot of backing this year, which is lovely to see. So one way or another, he's got himself in a top car, yeah. a real opportunity and that seeding's um, what a lot of people think he's capable of doing. Can he do it on this rally? That, I think that's a tough call. I, I think he probably could, but I think he probably won't because if it's early days in the car, he might not want to push it to that level. I'm not talking about yeah. just a fraction off, just to learn the car, get the feel for the road. So I think he'll do very, very well, possibly same as his seeding. But I think the top boys, because they've been in those cars for so long, they're comfortable with them, they're pushing to the limit. I think it'd just be a bit of common sense that will just come in and, you know. <laughs> I, I see him going for a championship drive and, um, I, you know, that yeah, good points. At this stage? Board. Yeah, at this stage, round one of the championship. Yeah. And then we've got Mark Kelly, another local driver, who's just come off the back of the win of his riding stages. Mm. Um, a really impressive win because there's a couple of drivers I'm going to mention in a minute, but he was up against the juniors and he's beat them fair and square on pace. He's an amazing driver. I'm so pleased to see because such a nice bloke as well. Yeah. Started off on a Mark II Escort, moved on to, I think, a Rally 5 uh, Fiesta, and then, you know, he moved on to this. And it just, you, you almost don't know what he's capable of. You, don't, you feel like he hasn't finished yet, you know. Um, a really big hearted guy, I know personally that he actually took some people who were sighted or blind people around three sisters just out the good of his heart for a run around, I know one of them personally and he does that sort of thing so somebody like that has got my vote every single day you know. Yeah and I don't think he'll mind, like we, we'd probably see him as a club driver mainly because he's, he's sociable and uh, you know, like I say, he's friendly, and uh, that's not that the others aren't, but they tend to be really focused on the. Uh, it's something I don't personally like as well, but it, it, you know, the, to the point where almost over professional, they're concentrating so much on every nuance of their performance, they become a little bit frosty to deal with. Mm. Whereas Mark's always been open, yeah. friendly, and I think he knows why he's there to enjoy it and have fun. But don't take anything away from it, professionalism, he does that. But if you yeah. remember, I think when I just got my car, I was taking it to Three Sisters for the first rally, for the first test, and you were saying, how do you think you do? And you were a bit surprised, I said, never driven a left-hand drive car and stuff like that. And there was an entry, and I think Mark Kelly was seated about four or three or something like that. He said, so who do you think is going to win then? I said, well, Mark Kelly. And you just went, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> we, both, we both knew, didn't we? He wasn't yeah. seated one, two, three or whatever, but we just knew that he had that pace, even quite a few years ago, and he just dominated, you know. Yeah, great guy as well. Yeah, winner of uh, outright rallies. Um, next up, uh, somebody, James Williams, who followed him into second place on the most recent result, his East Riding stages. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, Mark Kelly got the better of James Williams on that occasion, but James Williams very much focused on doing a British Rally Championship mm -hmm. uh, campaign out there, not 100% pushing. Um, uh, and from his point of view, he'll want revenge and he'll want to prove himself. You know that I, you know that for sure because he, when I saw him at the finish, um, yeah, if the opposite of a twinkle in an eye, there was a little <laughs> bit of anger there of not being able to yeah. fight. Uh, it makes you wonder whether the seeding came from the East Ride. He thought, well, if he beat him, we, yeah. we have to put. Is he in high and die? Is it something? Uh, it says car to uh, to be arranged. I believe yeah. he's got a high and die offer, yeah. and I believe there's a new car coming, but yet yeah. to be confirmed. The we'll move straight into car. Sorry, go on. We'll move straight into third place on East Riding stages. Was Callum Black, yeah. uh, and he's seeded at car eight. Again, um, James and Callum can swap who's winning a British Championship round. Uh, amazing to think that Callum's there is an absolute front runner, no question. Mm -hmm. And he's seeded at car nine, which shows the quality of the field. Um, he's won BRC rounds, so from Callum's point of view, mm -hmm. um, he's going to be right up there. And certainly, I think on his day, top three, no problem. It's just, I think somebody commented to me, I haven't checked the facts, but everybody in the top 30 has a won, won a rally outright. <laughs> I don't know if it's even longer than 30 but let's just say 30 you know so you get way down there's, there's really really great drivers at 10 at 15 at 20 and you go in a normal rally you go oh that's a terrible seeding what's he doing there and then you look above and you go well fair enough and, oh yeah fair enough. it's just the depth of this I have never seen an event like this it's what we thought if you think you get a top car like a, you know an R2 and R5 car put Max McRae in it limited experience first time out but surely he's but he's going to be running somewhere near the top 10. But no, 21, he's, you know, he'll be doing well if he's in that 
mix. So mm -hmm. if he's in the top ten, that he'll be, you know, that's a good performance. Yeah. Um, and we'll just round off the top ten with Paul McKinnon from uh, Mull. Mm. Who also yet to confirm what car or co-driver, but he's made his entry. <laughs> and then uh, at 10 is Gary Pearson, um, who I don't know much about, but he's got Daniel Barrett co-driving. So. Right, well, I'll butt in here then. He's a younger M Sport Works contracted driver this year. He was. I've just been come back from the Malcolm Wilson rally where I was marshalling, and I think he had a puncture, but he was leading after the first night. And we went watching later on, and his pace and commitment were brilliant, right up there. So without that, he, no, no taking anything from Elliot Payne, who won the event, but look at the sheer speed. I wouldn't be surprised if he could have won that event. That's on gravel, but he's equally good on tarmac, so very, very fast driver. Daniel Barrett is a world-level co-driver. He's navigated to, well, for Elfin and all sorts of top drivers. So he's got everything going. So he's got an M Sport car. He can drive really, really well, and he's got a fantastic co-driver. So, you know, watch this space, you know, sort of thing. Cool. Well, we could we could go on all night. Um, however, I'm just going to flick through, see if anybody grabs our attention. And Dave Wright, who won rallies outright uh, from Clitheroe District, and he's out in his uh, rally two. Dave well, on his day. Well, Dave's got my former co-driver Paul Swinsco with her, who's who's absolutely 100% professional, brilliant, and he's an amazingly talented driver. I mean, last year, he on the East Riding stage, he finished second, and the yeah. only reason he didn't win yeah. it is because he just had a spin on a muddy section. Um, on his day, oh my God, I mean, Dave could shock a few people as well, you know. Yeah. Seeded at 12, and I got certainly yeah. a top five finisher in my view. Um, I'm jumping down a little bit. We can't go past James Ford without mentioning that he's in a Citroen C3 Rally 2, which arguably is the car to be in, um, which I take as I'm slightly biased, but a lot of outright victories are coming from, uh, from Citroen Rally 2 cars now. Um, maybe the Polo's got it, but... Again, you can't really say which. There's no one dominant car. No, as good as good, you know. Fiestas are still. Um, think about James Ford, little known thing. You know the Silver Fern Rally, which he run every two years in is it New Zealand or something yeah. like that. He yeah. won that outright, a five day rally in a Mark II Escort, right? Yeah. Uh, and this C3, quietly, he's gone away with learning how to drive that really fast. He's been in Ireland against the toughest boys and trying to take the fight to them. And occasionally, oh man, I'm not going to say knocking a bit of a corner for but nothing serious really and I actually put him down you know is it unbelievable that he might have won the East Ridings and everyone said well no not at all look you know he, he led didn't it. he led it the previous yeah. year yeah. yeah oh so quick so he's another dark horse and I'm saying a lot of dark horse the speed of James Ford in that car yeah <laughs> so it's just where they can like keep it on the inside talking about a uh, another local rally hero and supporter and sponsor of the event we've got Neil Roscoe um, up next Oh, well, in my list, he's happened to be mm. seeded at 16, which I'm going to mention at the same time, he's seeded in front of Elliot Penn. Mm. So, uh, Neil, you've a lot to <laughs> well, live up to there, but... Neil's got a lot more tarmac experience than Elliot Penn. Yeah. He's won a lot of rallies outright. He's done a fantastic job, because he came to rally only about two, three years mm. ago, really. And he's had all this success. Fabulous driver, because he's hardly damaged the car, mm. which... To, do, to win those many rallies and achieve that pace, normally somebody has a biggie. And I don't wish you'd done it for God's sake, let's not say some wood quick. Uh, but yeah, amazingly talented driver. He just burst on the scene. And now he's afraid of nothing because he's going to do forest rally and go, oh, I've got that. And he's doing well at that as well. So just really talented driver, run by a very good team, ATM Sport, Neil Lyons and his friends. So they give him a really good, reliable car. Uh, I think he's changed co drivers this year. So, but it doesn't seem to make any difference. You know, they're both very good. He had a very good co driver the last couple, few years. Maybe it's because of the number of events he's doing. I don't actually know the reason he's changed to go around. But yeah, the, other, the only reason is above Elliot Payne. If it's a gravel rally, like we just had the Malcolm Wilson rally, no, Elliot was number one and Neil was number 10. Yeah. But everyone realises that this is his surface tarmac and Elliot is very good on it, but he's just learning. He hasn't done that many tarmac rallies. Yeah, it's interesting that because they, I, I couldn't bet on who's done the most rallies, but both of them, Elliot... Oh, Neil, they've, they've not done many in comparison. Probably only both been competing for three years um, mm. and doing a handful of rallies, you know, each year. So in that, in where they're actually able to run, um, to win the odd rally, both of them, um, yeah, it's fantastic. And, and it, Neil's a, a rally champion as well because he won championship uh, last year, I think. I think, I think. Well, it could I think have been two years ago. I think, he's won one, he's, I think he's won one, he was second and the other. Just so close, you know, a bit... Just a bit of bad luck to get you, but yeah. Okay, we'll carry on down our little path. Uh, 
just to give Elliot Payne some credit, fabulously quick guy. Once he gets out of time, I can be up there as well. Fantastic driver to watch, so exciting. And yeah, he'll be a champion in this when he gets his gets his eye in. And his confidence is up there, you know. So that's like, if he's straight off a win last weekend, yeah. a absolutely going to be there. Uh, another name that jumped out, Dave Borg is in his uh, mark to escort. Arguably one of the most beautiful sounding. Uh, cars, fantastic engine. The only thing there, I've no knowledge of this, but on the East Riding, he damaged it quite heavily at the front and quite heavily at the back. Yeah. So we're hoping we've managed to get it fixed. Yeah. He hasn't withdrawn his entry, so I assume he has. And another quick local driver, Jonathan Mosley, is uh, from Clitheroe, and he's in his uh, Fiesta R5. When interviewed in the East Riding stages, he said he was in. Uh, well, it's, in a, it's an R5 car, not an R2, mm. and I'm dying to know what the difference is for him. It looks like he's gone back uh, to a slightly older car, and he said it's not quite as quick as his R2 car, and uh, so it's still finding his feet. And But Jonathan, again, on his day, is a top 10 runner, in my view. He'll be uh, yeah. up there and trying very hard. Mm. Um, then we are going down to... I'm actually looking for you now, Nigel. Uh, keep going. But 47. That's, that's <laughs> outrageous, everybody. 47. No, it's actually <laughs> fair, and I'll tell you why. Two reasons. Uh, first of all, the sheer quality of the entry, which is fair enough. And the other thing is, we've really struggled to sort the suspension on this particular car. Uh, and I thought I'd found the answer before the East Riding. And the idea was to go on the East Riding, drop the car on the ground, get used to it, and then I could set off really quick on the northwest stages, knowing what it would do. Anyway, it turns out we hadn't actually found out what the issue was, but I think we really have now. I think we really have. The only disadvantage of that is that instead of hitting the ground running, I'm starting from square one, because you can't just set off a bumpy, fast, straight, six gear and just assume it's all going to do it. It'll take a little bit to sort of decide what it'll do and believe in the car, really. So it'll take a little bit of time to build up. But honestly, you look at the seeding and you go, Oh, I'd like to be high, and then you start looking at the people. You go, well, you know, I haven't done particularly well this last couple of years because of various reasons like this. So, the beauty of rallying, and this is the beauty of it, we all start with zero penalties, right? So I've got the same chance as everybody else. It doesn't matter what the number on. It's down to me on the day to show what I can do. And I'm really happy with that. That'll do me. It's true that, and the quality of the field is amazing. I'm probably a little bit like me because I'm now an owner of an R5 car in a similar... In fact, we can have this discussion, and I think it's a fair discussion to have, not only because I've got a vested interest in it, but when I bought my car, and I'm sure you were exactly the same, it, by far, my Peugeot 208 R5 car, it's sort of coming up to being 10 years old, and I thought it's the fastest car I've ever driven, it's easily going to be able to win a club rally. Mm. And then I turned up at... Three Sisters, which is basically a go-kart circuit, thinking, well, this car, my car, should easily be able to win. And I've seen you exactly the same. Your car should easily be able to win. And then you look at it against the competition. I think on the first time I turned up, there was 12 R5 cars, a couple of Darians and, mm. uh, you know, really fast escorts. But basically, our cars are just a bit too old, aren't they, to really... I mean, I, I, and they're still fast, well, Maybe exciting. we're a bit too old, Well, it could be, it could be <laughs> us. No, um, but what, what I'm saying is the generation of cars from just 10 years, and, and I'm going to say this about the whole entry, yeah. some of the later running R5 cars that are generation 1 R5 cars, mm. they're not far behind, but they're to the point where maybe they're just a second a mile behind, mm. and that's almost impossible to make up. Mm. So the reality is some of those brand new R5 car, uh, cars are £350,000, and our cars are not. And the other thing, not you've got cheap. To, I mean, <laughs> no. about that, turning up with the car, when we were a lot younger, we used to, if you turn up a small rally like that in a really top car, like you used to have a Mark II Escort, you'd be accused of what they call pot hunting, which is turning up, guaranteed to win, just to take a trophy on. And we didn't do it because it was embarrassing to do that. But you can't do that any longer. Anyway. It's not a problem. No. I can turn up with my car, like you do, at Three Sisters, which is a top car. I mean, if Chris Ingham drove it, he'd probably... You know, do nearly as well as he would in his. You know, it's a really, really good car. Um, but if you turn up at a local event, you're not pot hunting because, like you said, there's ten others. Yeah. At that point, it's fair game, isn't it? Because, yeah. You know, absolutely. And I mean, anybody, even three sisters, John Stone winning it or Mark Kelly. Um, but either of those two, we know that they're driving really well. And I love it to see it from a spectator's point of view because basically, you can go to a little club rally and watch ten top cars. And, and, and I'm saying that because there are fives. The Darians have moved on so much. You know, yeah. they look fantastic. The escorts, the quality of the field for club rallying is, you know, I used to be able to go in a two-wheel drive 106 
virtually standard car and easily running the top ten of that rally. Yeah, I know. You know, maybe fifth, maybe even third. <laughs> Uh, so there's only at best one good four wheel drive car. So I, I love the idea that the quality is out there. And actually, I don't, I've never asked you this question, but I, I don't mind finishing 10th, 4th, 5th, whatever the best result is, because the cars are exciting to drive, aren't they? Mm. You do get good value for money as a competitor, because even on a basic, simple, basically sprint circuit, it's still exciting to set off. Mm. The launch controls and you know the corner speeds and everything, again, it might just be age and we're, I'm a, out of practice, but I'm still thrilled by it. So therefore, I see good value for money. And it's not about taking a trophy on, but did you enjoy your sport? And absolutely, there's great value. And yeah. that's what I think of this field. There's a big story there in rallying that the cars have got expensive, the technology's moved on so much. But right now, if you buy an R5 car, no matter where you run on this field, you'll have a hell of a rally. And even to the point where I'm scared of this rally. I don't mind saying it. Mm -hmm. So it, my prediction is if, I, if you didn't drive at eight tenths, you could have an accident because it's a, it, it, you know, it's a bumpy rally, it's demanding, it'd be very easy to get dragged into a, you know, I want to finish in the top 10 and, yeah. and push yourself a little bit too far. And, and you yeah. didn't. So last year you had a good result. The mud scared me really because we were going up the back of Beacon Fell and it's a really, really fast bit and the car just suddenly went left in fifth or sixth gear. I'm like, and I managed to bring it back, but and I tried it again, and when the power came, I did the same thing. I'm like, oh, God, you know, and you, you just, but I put a huge amount of detail into my pace notes, a huge amount more than most people, and that's why I have to pick very, very good co-drivers. And I had Steve Clark on the last one, and also he's riding last year, who was absolutely brilliant. And I'm really fortunate to have Chris Williams this time, who is unbelievable in his preparation, and he's got the same mindset as me. Let's you know put every single detail in because. If you put every dip, bump, crest, bend and everything in, well, it's down to you. But I never leave anything to chance. I don't say, well, for 500 up here, it's pretty straight. Carry on. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'll split it up and, you know, it might be dip, flat crest, flat left, 200 something, every single bit. And I sort of tick them off mentally because then there'll be a crest into a bad bend and you need to know exactly where it is. And you can only do that if you've ticked those bits off. If you put 500 to bad left, you don't know where the bad left's going to be or something, you know, simplifying obviously here, but... Do you know that, I, let's have that conversation because you've, you've got a really good point there that I'm going to bring into about R5 and why I might be reluctant to do a rally at this level. And it's because I don't have, the, like maybe now I've done a couple of rallies, but I've realised that the R5 car is, has got the potential of picking up speed in a way that I'm not used to. Mm. And because of that, even making a pace note where I'd normally be competent at, at it, um, without some understanding of how that car performs, mm. I don't think I could make a, a pace note that would make any sense because it's very difficult for me to predict from this distance to this distance, the car will be traveling at that speed. And I'll give you another one, the suspension. The suspension yeah. is fantastic from a braking point of view, from absorbing a bump, but I'm not used to be able to look at a bump and say, oh, well, that's no problem. Mm. a bit like a world rally car so well, I won't even put it in the notes mm. and then other ones where if I go back to my two or five time I could look at something and put a caution in or a don't cut and I'd know not to cut because mm. that car I was driving couldn't cope with what I, I knew I would attack it you know the, the rate mm. at which I'd attack that corner but with an R5 I've no idea so I, I you know I admire the fact that you've gone out and had the confidence to make a pace note that you're then going to drive an R5 car on. You've got to visualise it because even on the wreck here, you don't, I don't go quick, 25, 30 miles after that, you know. And I'm going down, but in the mind, I'm visualising it. And, and if I think there's a crest or a dip or something, put it in and where, where I think the car might jump. Yeah. If it doesn't jump, it, it's okay, you know, but you're better that way. And I also, my pace notes are like, like I'm 100 yards up the road telling me what to do, you know what I mean? Yeah. So let's say I might have flat out crest. 50 yards but if I have to turn suddenly right at the end of that I'll add something to that to, to, to warm me so I'll have flat crest 50 braking me turn 90 right no 90 degrees right so that I won't go flat over the crest and, and then go and that's how you see these people sailing past junctions hopefully I shouldn't do that because I'm telling me yes this crest is flat out but as soon as you've done that you need to run the brakes because you're turning you know so it, it's almost like shorthand just about 100 yards in front of me me telling me what to do and it goes like, oh yeah that 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 yeah and a lot of it comes back because if i've written it it's so personal there might be some particular instruction i've put like you know 
a bend after a crest with a tree on the left or something like that and, and it'll make it unique to me. I, I do exactly that um, but the difficulty there and maybe you've done it because you've come from your World Rally Car Escort but did you find it easy then to cope with the speed of the S2000 and we'll basically call it an R5 car but your mm. current car is that a big jump up from the World Rally Car Escort? No it's not really to be honest mm. and um, the thing is, I mean, I've done a lot of pace notes. I've done Lombard RAC rallies where you've done five days of pace notes and you've only got two passes. Now, to get the pace notes right on two passes, one just right, first of all, you just write it down and then you get one chance to correct it. That's your lot. Next time you do it, it might be in the dark in sheet ice, whatever. It's got to be right. By the way, I don't actually call them 40 degrees and 50 degrees. I go one, two, three, four, five, six. One fast. One's fast in my case, there's another system, I won't go into that. One is at 10 degrees with a zero knocked off, it's just quicker to say. Yeah. And the reason I don't go on beyond six is because seven is a double syllable letter. And there's not many sevens or eights, there's very, very few. So we'll go one to six, which is like 60 degrees, and then we jump to 90, which is 90 degree right, which I know it's weird, you should call it a nine, I suppose you could do, but don't have to do that. And then I have other fine tuning things because there's little bits in between. You need your notes more accurate on the very, very fast thing because if you're slightly out at very high speed, you can be off the road. If you're slightly out on a hairpin at 90 degree bend, you'll be all right, you can cope with it. Yeah, that's roughly what I do. That It's a position of hand and then whether I think it's fast or not. Mm. So if it was, it could be a right five absolute, mm. meaning it's wide enough to go fast. And yeah. that's speed dependent on the previous corner. Mm. But yeah, the, you're talking my language in personal terms. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's interesting because with the juniors that I'm doing now with my son, Zach, um, even at the at that very basic level, he's getting into pace notes. And, but when I asked him about doing his barge test, and the first thing, and I said, you know, what did you enjoy the most about doing the barge test? First time ever in a rally car. And he said, being counted down in real time, and the core driver, the person doing the instruction, giving him directions. Really? Because he'd never heard that other than on the PlayStation. So, well, interestingly, somebody said, there's another system, which is the other way around, where six is faster, so that's sixth yeah. gear. Yeah. And a lot of the youngsters do that, and the biggest reason is they've all come on Colin McRae. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they've grown up listening to Colin McRae video games, so they all want six as fast as so. I, I can tell you a quick story about <laughs> yeah. that, of why, why it would make sense. And traditionally speaking, from a personal point of view, you do it the way we're doing it. But mm. you, And if you say you turn the steering wheel this much, mm. no matter what car you're in, you always turn it mm. this much. However, when I was competing in the Alps uh, against other, in the Peugeot one way championship against other French Peugeots, we started to realise that when we had something like 42 hairpins at the start of one of the stages to climb a mountain, mm. that what they were doing is first or second, mm. so one or two, mm. depending on if, it, if the car would pull second gear. Mm. So it might only be one in every eight corners, but it was critical to get the speed. So the pace note went out of the window and the mm. speed related gear note was everything. It would change if you changed the car, mm. but should just for one rally, I had to make dedicated racing notes that were just for changing gear, um, which was a little bit of braking distance, but that made a really big difference on that rally. Absolutely. I mean, all the bends around us are def defined bends like that, they seem mm. to be. But in the Alps, a lot of these ones that go round a mountain, yeah. well, you can't use my system of three because it's not a 30 degree bend. Mm. And you start putting all sorts of long three bend and very long three bend, yeah. well, it's not really telling you much. And you're absolutely right, if you flip it the other way, and I actually heard that's how they have gear base, so it doesn't matter how long the bend carries on, you go into it in third gear, and it'll do all that bend in third gear. Yeah. So you just go long three right, and you just go, yeah. you know, and, and our pace, English pace notes, it wouldn't work, uh, and these Monte Carlo type ones, these French type ones, do work on their roads, but maybe not so well over here. People who really know the history might remember Colin McRae, I think in the legacy on the RAC on Clumber Park, completely missing a bend going yeah. flying and the reason is he got braking at a toilet block moved it and no one of these historic cars had hit it and moved it i had braking at the same toilet block but uh, my notes i just got must have gone <laughs> i mean that's why i mean not he's not as quick as him but he he was shooting past because he's like where's this toilet block like, oh <laughs> should have gone up there you know so that's how dependent you can be on certain things and it's invisible to the spectators they have no idea what's going on inside that car in the isle of man i go you know so long right hand at times at yellow bush and it's a really good point that year you've got to make sure the next year it's the same there it's the same bush and it's still yellow you know you do it in september it might not be
So it's a good point. Well, it's great to drift into pace notes because pace yeah. notes is the first thing that you're going to do on this rally. It's mm. a massive part of gaining the speed. Um, two-person job. And like I say, for people that don't know the event, the event for you starts this weekend. Mm. Um, so just give us a quick overview of what that is. It's really weird because we buy pace notes from a guy who goes down and writes specialist pace notes. And the beauty of that, it means there's only one car traversing the route and therefore annoy people just once and 120 or many of us all get a copy of these pace notes and we get a USB stick and a copy of these pace notes and you can go on your computer so you can actually go through the stage and see whether you agree with it or see if you understand what he means and everything like that still without going on the route and then they actually uh, allocate in this case two different days um, this is Saturday for all but I think a week on Friday is another day it's normally one day and we're allowed to go around the route slowly twice all the stages twice can't do any more than twice uh, and that's for us to put our little touch on it what we think so he might the guy who does the note Craig Parry is brilliant they are really good he had him on these riding and I sent him a message said I've got a complaint about your pace note I said what's that I said well I used to get an advantage by making great pace notes yours are so blooming good everybody else just has it handed on to another plate he said that's the best complaint I've ever heard you know anyway I still change them a little bit so I you know when we go down I might a bit faster or bump or something. So we go twice around, make those things, and then the co-driver has these sat on his lap. And then when it comes to the start of the rally, he's going to read them back to me, and we're going to go as fast as we possibly can down that road based on what he's telling me. And the trust in both directions is incredible. I've got to trust him he doesn't turn two pages over, which he never does. Yeah. And he's got to trust me that I'm going to stay on the road. Last person, uh, well, second to last person on the rally, car 129, is Hazel Johnson. <laughs> Steve Johnson's daughter in a Nissan Micra. So I'm really just pointing out that there's 130 cars doing it. Brilliant. There's a lot of different characters uh, doing it. And in the ranks of anybody spectating, watching some of those lower runners come through the stage, they're not going to be on the pace of the BRC drivers, but each of them have got their own special event, mm -hmm. their own cars, and in their own way, their own teamwork and, and you know and driving. And many of them will be doing the rallies for the first time and using very cheap motors because I always like to, for people that don't know much about rallying, it's nice to say, yeah, some of these front running cars are nearly half a million pound. Mm. So there's 20, 30 million pounds worth of car run, cars r running at the front. Uh, but Hazel Johnson will be in a club car there that's worth a couple of thousand, run by a dad, her and her dad. Mm. Um, and it's nice to see that there are beginners out there doing this exactly the same event on a realistic budget that a lawful lot of people could afford if they want to go rallying for fun. And she's massively involved in the sport. I went to the SD34 Awards <coughs> in Accrington on Saturday night and she was there, you know, helping out and organising it. So, you know, these people are involved in every area of the sport. I think it's 85. Louis Baines and Chris Coombs, it should be. Yeah. Okay, on there. Now, I think they seem to swap seats, but Chris recently has done three different types of events like a night rally, which he won outright, I think for the first time, brilliant. And then he went to did a, one of these uh, Targa rallies, I think he finished second on that, and then did, you know, the amount of variation to get out of that car, we call it the WRC Micro, you know what I mean, but he drives the wheels off it. But I would have thought he'd be driving, but I think uh, Louis's driving this time, and he <laughs> usually quite often navigates, so they swap over. So even though that won't have massive power, um, that's a, uh, an indication of what you're saying about people having a really good go and driving the wheels of the car even though it doesn't cost a fortune and they're realistic like I'm realistic about we're not going to win the event he's not going to invent neither am I but it takes satisfaction I really enjoy driving down those roads as fast as he can and they'll do really well for the car trust me you know so that's great they're local as well so that's great Lovely. Well, thanks for the chat. We got very uh, involved in rallying and what it takes to be a driver, which is uh, hopefully, well, in fact, anybody that's got to the end of this uh, short chat, which was a bit longer than I anticipated, uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. That was me and Nige talking all about rallying uh, and pace notes and things like that. We hope to see you on the rally uh, if you're watching Nigel and if you're not you might be watching me at home because we'll be presenting or I'll be presenting uh, the live broadcast from here in the studio. Look forward to seeing you soon. Come on.